Uh, everyone just bow heads. We're going to open with a word of prayer this morning. Our loving and merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this new day that you've blessed us with. Another opportunity to come together, to be strengthened in our faith, to be reminded of those faithful men and women of old. We pray that as we continue our study this morning, you'll bless our time here together, and that our eyes will be open to your word and the truth that is therein. We pray for those who are unable to join us this morning. You know their reasons, and we pray that you will grant them the blessing as you see fit. We pray that everything we do this morning will be pleasing in your sight, that we will be encouraged by the things that we discuss. We praise you and we thank you through the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All righty. So for those of you who haven't um, been here during our study, uh, we're still focusing on Hebrews chapter 11. Um, we've been, I started back in, um, I think, verse 22, several weeks ago, and we've been really trying to uh, delve into what message is trying to be to getting across in this chapter. Uh, we've been looking a lot at Moses and the faithful acts that he's done. And we've been getting a lot of good, good uh, discussion going on. So if you do have any comments or questions during the class, uh, feel free to you know, pipe up. Um, don't feel bad about interrupting. Uh, we love some good discussion. Uh, this morning, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Um, the previous week, just to recap, uh, we discussed further examples of faith that were shown by Moses. We also looked at connections between the Passover and the elements which point towards Christ. Uh, we also looked uh, at quite a few examples of how Moses was a type of Christ. Um, this week, we'll continue our study by looking at the last few verses that cover Moses' faithful acts. Um, and that's uh, beginning at verse 29. So that's Hebrews 11 and verse 29. It says, And by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. And so... <laughs> It, this this uh, example that's mentioned in verse 29, um, it's a, it's a well-known story that we, we uh, are aware, aware of from when we were taught in Sunday school being brought up about how the children of Israel, um, by the power of God, crossed over the Red Sea on dry land. Um, it's quite a miraculous event. Uh, just a couple of facts about the Red Sea. Uh, it's, it's approximately 1,400 miles long, and at its widest point, it's about 220 miles wide. The average depth is around 1,600 feet, and the deepest point in the Red Sea is actually close to around 10,000 feet deep. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to read from the account of the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. Uh, from Exodus chapter 14, and it's, it's, a, it's a larger section of verses. We're going to begin at verse 8, and we're going to read through to verse 31. Um, uh, Sister Catherine, could you read verse 8 to 15? And then Brother David Pinkston, could you read from verse 15 through to the end of the chapter, please? So that's Exodus 14. And beginning of verse 8, and we're going to read through to the end. I just kind of split it up. It's a long section. You want me to read 8, uh, eight verse 8 through what? 15. 8 through 15 of, verse, of chapter Exodus 14? Yes, please. Okay. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, 
and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camped at the sea by, I can't pronounce that, <laughs> I had no idea, and in, front of, in front of Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor over Pharaoh and over all of his host, over his chariots and over his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten my honor over Pharaoh, over his chariots and over his horsemen. The angel of God who went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to those, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked upon looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drove them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its strength when the Mount when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea and the water returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them, but the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord in his servant Moses. All right, thank you. So I felt like it was important for us to uh, look back at the account uh, where this event occurred. It, it gives us uh, quite a bit of information. Of course, it po it points out the initial doubt and fear that the, the people expressed. Uh, you read early on in the section we read, you know, they're literally asking, you know, okay, this, this is why we were brought out into the wilderness because there wasn't enough graves in Egypt. I always get kind of a, a kick out of that when I read it, um, you know, because <laughs> that, that wasn't the intention. Uh, you can recall from the the last uh, last week when we discussed the Passover and how uh, ultimately that was that was an effort on God's on God's uh, and to provide salvation for His chosen people. And so um, you you can see how God directs Moses. Uh, he tells him to fear not. 
and to stand still and to see the salvation of the Lord. And you can, and it's just such a miraculous uh, event that we have recorded for us here. Uh, once again, showing that nothing is impossible with our God. And so Moses lifts his rod and stretches out his hand over the sea, and it divides itself. And the children of Israel go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And so certainly the faith of the people and of Moses was demonstrated here in this moment. Despite the initial outcries of doubt by the children of Israel, God worked through Moses and provided salvation for his chosen people. And this experience was to be recounted to all generations. And it appears to have been carried out faithfully. Uh, this crossing of the Red Sea is mentioned uh, several other times um, throughout scripture. Uh, note in uh, the book of Nehemiah, chapter nine, verse 11, Nehemiah recounts the amazing power of God when he references the crossing of the Red Sea. We also have several references um, by David uh, when he speaks of God's power. And we're going to look at a couple of those this morning. You want to turn with me to Psalm 66. So at Psalm 66 and verse 6, and if I could have Sister Debbie, could you read that, please? He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. Okay. All right. And the next one is Psalm 78. Uh, verse 12 and 13. And uh, Sister Amanda, can you read that? So Psalm 78, verse 12 and 13. 12 and 13. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zohan, Zohan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through and he made the waters to stand as, as a heap. As a heap, yeah. Thank you. And then the last one we're gonna look at in the Old, the Old Testament is um, Psalm 106. It's uh, Psalm 106 beginning of verse nine and reading through to verse 11. And uh, Brother Johnny, if you could read that for us, please. 106, what, what, what verse nine? Verse nine through 11. 106. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of their enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. They sang his praises. Um, Thank you. And uh, for those of you who didn't notice, uh, uh, Sister Man and Brother Johnny sent a, a message over chat uh, referencing Acts chapter 7. And... Uh, in the previous weeks, we've been uh, noticing uh, the connections between Acts 7 with Stephen's uh, response to the, the high priests um, and the connections with Hebrews 11. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, again, it, it's, it's something that's been referenced multiple times. Um, and so certainly it's something for us to take note of. And so consider earlier in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, when we look at the birth and the upbringing of Moses and how it's described as being faithful, uh, how we discuss the ark that Moses was put into as being a covering for him. 
and how contrary to the decree of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Moses' life was spared rather than being drowned in the river and lost. Again, we are presented with a picture of salvation and covering provided to the Israelites when they are crossing the Red Sea on dry land. And there are at least a couple of verses that reference this event found in the New Testament. In uh, Isaiah 51, verse 9 and 10, the children of Israel are referred to as being ransomed. Uh, let's, let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to read the first five verses, well, first four verses, sorry. And uh, Sister Lee, if you could read that. So it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, please. You went, Leo, we can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I hit the unmute button, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Thank you. Now, despite this miracle, uh, we know how this story progressed. Uh, the children of Israel stumbled and were made to wander the wilderness 40 years until after the death of Moses. And during this time, God molded a new and faithful leader by the name of Joshua, who was set to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Now, as you can imagine, this was not an easy task. However, with God on their side, there was nothing that was impossible. Hebrews 11 verse 30 reads, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Again, this is a, a story we've, we've been brought up in Sunday school. Um, I think we're well aware of the, the account. Uh, however, we're going we're gonna to go there to Joshua chapter 6. So it's Joshua chapter 6. And we're going to read the first five verses. And uh, Sister Ruth, Ann, can you read that, please? So that's Joshua chapter 6. Verses 1 through 5. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when, and when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. Thank you. So there was a period of time in between where the children of Israel spent time preparing for this great event. It, it wasn't something um, where they got just before the River Jordan and then boom, they, they took on Jericho. There was a lot of preparation involved. Um, we can recount how Joshua sent two spies into the land of Jericho to search it out. And this is where we're introduced to uh, Rahab, and so let's just consider uh, the amount of time briefly uh, in between the spies entering into Jericho and searching it out and the, the kind of the final moments of uh, the, the town of Jericho. So uh, it begins with the spies coming to Rahab. And we can recall how it, word had spread around the city about it's basically upcoming doom uh, as Rahab uh, 
voices to the spies, uh, what she's aware of. We're gonna, and we're gonna look at that in a few minutes. Uh, so at that point, the, the three spies were hid in the mountains. Um, at least one day for the spies to return to the camp and another three days before the officers um, put forth a command to the people. And that's in Joshua chapter three, verse two. I'm just gonna read that. It says, and Joshua rose early in the morning and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the hosts. Okay, so there, there we have our first week. Okay, so there's already been a week of preparation. There's been some movement in the camp coming closer and closer to the town of Jericho. At that point, we, we have the account where they cross the River Jordan and then they set up stones to commemorate this event. Um, then of course we have the circumcision and the several days that were taken to recover from that. Uh, afterwards, we have the Passover on the 14th day. And so here we've had, we've had four days since entering Canaan. And that's, uh, so Joshua chapter four, verse 19, says, and the people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones, which they took out of Jordan, did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel saying, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come saying, what mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea when he dried up from before us until we were gone over. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. And so for those of you who have been with us the last few weeks, we've Notice time and time again that these pivotal moments in Israel's history uh, where they've been commanded to repeat these miraculous stories and what happened to the future generations. Uh, we saw it with Joseph and how he told his family about the, the future, how they would certainly depart from Egypt. Uh, we've looked at uh, countless times where the events were were repeated to the future generations and when when you really stop and think about it um it's it's such a blessing for us um to have recorded in the the scriptures these miraculous events so that we too can recount to our future generations the power of our god All right, so at this point, there's already been two weeks of preparation involved. Um, it, it's, it's quite, quite a, a time period. And then as you can recount, uh, when Sister Ruthann read that section of verses, we have another seven days, the six days where they walked around uh, Jericho and then the seventh day on that final blast when the walls of Jericho are, are taken down by the power of, of God. And so just keep this in the back of your mind that there was at least three weeks between uh, the two spies meeting with Rahab and the deliverance that, that we're well aware of that occurred for Rahab and her family. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Does anyone have any comments at this point they'd like to share before we move on? All right, well, we'll, we'll keep moving on. Of course, if you do have any questions or anything, feel free to bring them up. So, like I said before, it, it's important for us that we don't overlook the huge role that Rahab played in all of this. 
Uh, consider her words in Joshua chapter 9. Uh, cha sorry, Joshua chapter 2. And we're going to read verse 9 through 13. If uh, Brother Jason Winterling, if you read that for us, that's Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 through 13. All right, Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. Uh, and he said to the men, I know the Lord has given you land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For we heard, for the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now, then uh, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my mother and father, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. Thank you. It, it, it's interesting that uh, James sees it fit that a nod to Rahab's faithful act is mentioned in James 2, verse 25. And he says, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Now, Rahab is re referenced three times as a harlot. And when I looked into this, there appears to be a variety of different explanations regarding Rahab's actual profession. However, regardless of this, we do know that Rahab was a Gentile and lived in a society that disregarded God. How, Rahab heard of the miraculous things that the God of Israel had done to their enemies, and we just, we just read that account. And so her actions of hiding the spies was seen as a faithful act. By this act, she purposefully chose to attach herself to the children of God. In so doing, she saved the lives of her family and ultimately is mentioned as being part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew 1 verse 5. Now, Rahab is not the only Gentile that chose to attach herself to the children of Israel and in so doing took hold of the promises made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Rahab's example is reminiscent of the choice that Ruth, a Moabite, made herself. Turn with me to Ruth chapter 1. We're going to read from Ruth chapter 1. And Brother Paul, if you could read Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, please. Okay. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And for where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And where I will be buried, may, and, and where I will be buried, may the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, "No more." All right, thank you. Now. Both Rahab and Ruth are great examples of women of faith who, despite their background, whether through birth or profession, were willing to change and to join themselves to an eternal promise, putting away those worldly things. And so the example of Rahab makes an important point in regards to the fact that um, she perished not with them that believe not. That's, that's the latter end of verse 31 in Hebrews 11. 
I think that's a really important point for us mm -hmm. to know. And so this was true of the Egyptians as well and puts an emphasis on belief and how faith is truly a combination of belief, belief and action as highlighted in James. Now, this is a choice that we need to make in our lives today, if we haven't already, to trust in God and show that trust in the way that we act. And again, you know, it's such a blessing for us to have these examples recorded, to see these men and women who saw the promises afar off and did not live to see them fulfilled. And so we need to look ahead in every circumstance and endure to the end. And so that's, that's all I have for this morning. Um, I'm gonna, we have a few minutes left. Uh, if we have any comments or questions, you know, we have an opportunity now. Yeah, um, I have a little comment if, you, if it's all right. Oh, crap, I'm something up. Am I on mute? Yeah, no, yeah you're good. good. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, um, so in chapter 20 of Revelation, right, when you're talking about being let out from the sea, it says here in... <clears throat> Verse, I feel, well, I personally have always thought of it this way, like at the very end when it says, and after the thousand years, Satan shall be loosed out of this prison. And it says, and he shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth to gather them together to battle the number of whom is like the sand of the sea. And it says that they encompass the camp of the saints about of God and the beloved city and the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Um, I feel like that's kind of like the very last being led out of, or being, you know, Pharaoh's army being destroyed is similar to, you know, Satan at the end. And my personal belief is that, because it says in verse five right before that, but the rest of the dead did not come to life again until the end of the thousand years were finished. Um, and it says, um, then in chapter seven, it says, and then a thousand years ended and Satan will be loosed from his prison. And prison is alluded to a lot as, you know, the grave or death in the Bible. Uh, so I just feel like in the second resurrection, like all the, you know, the wicked will be resurrected. And it seems like it's kind of like a foreshadowing of like, you know, in the end when all the wicked will be destroyed and God will lead his people like, ultimately out of it. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like that's not exactly the same, you know, but it's sort of an allusion to it, you know, like a parallel to it. And I always feel like, you know, it, hey, it, it, they go together somehow, you know? I always, I always- Hey, Brother Johnny? Yeah. Uh, this is Leah. I can't see you when I'm speaking because I'm on my phone. <laughs> um, I think it's awesome that you're, you know, thinking through all that stuff, you know, what it all means in Revelation 20. I mean, of course, it's all very symbolic. Um, you know, there's a, a class on Revelation going on right now on Thursdays, uh, which is on the same same uh, page on the Richmond Chapel website as the uh, Sunday school class, Thursday night at 7. And we're going through uh, those chapters in Revelation, uh, not quite to Revelation 20 yet, but we will be. And uh, there's some really good stuff that's going to be shared uh, on that if you guys would like to join us. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And just just an interesting point, too. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about Moses and, how, you know, how the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt. And in the scriptures, Egypt is alluded to as, as, as sin a lot of the time. Um, and just considering um, just how many times, um, you know, the, the children of Israel rebelled against God, you know, they showed their sinful nature, and yet 
God was willing to continually work with them to bring them to this, this promised land. And ultimately, you know, when it comes to when we were talking about the Gentiles, how he, you know, he, he wants all of us to have a part in the promises and all the, the amazing things that are going to occur uh, when his son returns. So that, no, that's a great, great connection you brought up with between Revelation and it, it's been quite, quite clear to see a connection. So thank you for that comment. You know, Brother Brian, um, I've often thought about <clears throat> Joshua on the day that he was going to, you know, command the whole army of Israel to go up against Jericho. And you know, what he would have felt when he woke up on that day. And, you know, of course, he had been given instructions on what to do, but I think, you know, he wasn't sure exactly how all this was going to be accomplished. And, you know, all they could see was, you know, physically what they could see, not what God, God was doing uh, or was going to do. And, uh, of course, you got these walls, you know, so high and so strong, you know, just almost seemed impenetrable. And then beyond the walls, you know, people who looked like giants. So, you know, this, this seemed very impossible to man, probably. But what I love about that story is how the captain of the Lord's army, which was the angel who was leading them, showed up. And he must have been in some kind of, I'm thinking, military outfit or something, you know. Because Joshua said to him, are you for us or are you against us? And he said, neither, but as the captain of the Lord's army have I now come. And so he, he kind of took away all of Joshua's fears and basically told them, look, this is not up to you. I'm the one leading this charge. You know, you just follow me. You know, this is not man's job. And I think in our lives, you know, Many times we kind of look at, um, you know, hurdles that we have to overcome, spiritual hurdles or maybe hurdles in our relationship uh, with our children, with our brothers and sisters, with the world, whatever. And we think, you know, we have to do it all. But really all we have to do is surrender to God. And, you know, the captain of the Lord's army, um, well, Jesus is really our captain now, but, you know, he will lead us. And he will kind of pave the way for us before we get there. And I think that in itself is a very encouraging a message of faith for us. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry, if I could add real quick to that, what you said. Um, I know it's not exactly what it says, but it says here that um, in, chap in, in, in Hebrews 11, you guys probably already read this, but just going back to remind everybody, it says, according, it says that Abraham knew that he would receive back Isaac because that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a sense. So like, you know, like I was saying that we should always remember that no matter what happens, God's ultimately going to raise us from the dead to rule the earth again, you know, so we don't have to be fearful. And I feel like the apostles were the greatest example of that always because they obviously were always, you know, some of them were teetering, but when Jesus came back to life, that was a very strong, obviously that was why they were so empowered with the Holy Spirit later on, you know, so. And uh, I myself didn't really understand that till I got older, the power of it, you know, of, of the immortality. Because Paul says in Romans, that those who seek for, you know, glory, honor, and immortality, God will give life, you know, and persisting in doing good. So I find that as the most encouraging thing, you know. So thank you for what you were saying about not being able to see always the, the future, but we do know the future, at least in the sense that, that God can raise us from the dead no matter what happens, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important to remember. That's a good point. All righty. So our, our time is up this morning.
Um, I think I'll probably finish off the chapter next week. Um, I'm not sure who's on to continue our study, but I'll make sure that gets passed on. Uh, Brother Paul, would you be able to close our Sunday school in prayer? Sure. Thank you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, thank you so much for giving us your word this morning and letting us learn from each other and growing in you, Lord. And Lord, please be with us today as we try to not just hear these things, but do your word and honor your you, Lord. And again, use this to be salt and light for others to follow us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, God willing, we look forward to uh, getting back to our studies again. Um, God willing, next week. Hope everyone has a great morning. And I'll see you uh, another time. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brother Brian. Take care. Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for joining us. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah, I didn't think he was going to get it.